Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. I'm Armin Georgian. Europe needs its social market economy more than ever, the EU Commission President said in her annual State of the Union speech to MEPs and assemble guests here in Strasbourg. Well, that's music to the ears of my guest. Nicola Schmidt is the EU Commissioner for Employment and Social Rights, and it's his job to strengthen Europe's social dimension and to ensure support for workers and job seekers. He has always maintained that Europe is not a neoliberal economic project. Uh, Nicola Schmidt held top government positions in his co home country, Luxembourg, before being appointed to his current job in 2019. Commissioner Schmidt, welcome to the program. Thank you. So overall, what was your impression of this speech? Did it go in a direction that you've been arguing for for a long time? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and this uh, happens in a very special time. I think uh, we have never experienced such a pressure, such a such changes also in terms of uh, uh, social but also economic uh, changes. We, we thought that after COVID we would find a recovery. We thought that uh, uh, we uh, could uh, in, a, in a calm way proceed to the uh, politi policies for climate change. And then came the war and all the impact, uh, the tragic and terrible impact of this war for the Ukrainians, and this was a moment also uh, to pay tribute to the courage of the Ukrainians, but also to many millions of European citizens who are really suffering and uh, are afraid of the future. What is the threat to jobs from the energy crisis? Well, you know that uh, with this e incredible increase of energy prices, a lot of companies, a lot of enterprises in sectors that are big consumers of energy. Uh, the problem is that they uh, have difficulty to continue uh, production. And this starts not just the big companies, steel, glass, uh, to give the chemi chemicals. Uh, this is also very small companies like the baker, you know, the baker who uh, needs energy to just to, uh, 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 to bake it, uh, his bread. And uh, this is a pressure yeah. on these companies. And there is a threat that they stop their production that they cannot afford anymore paying for the energy or that they just displace uh, the pro production outside Europe. Which leads us to the, one of the uh, remedial measures that uh, Ursula von der Leyen announced in the State of the Union address, which was uh, a, a package for SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. But do you think what she's proposing is enough to offset that risk of the, the baker, as you put it, ending production and laying off staff? Well, I think we have, uh, that's one element of, of a whole bunch of, of uh, proposals. First, we have to, uh, to uh, uh, influence, to act on the energy markets. And here, there are very concrete proposals on uh, uh, price capping, very important. Uh, also, taking away these exceptional profits, because there are uh, companies uh, who are making exceptional profits and taking part of that away and redistribute uh, to households, but also to companies who are suffering from the prices. So the gains of, the, uh, of part of, uh, of the, uh, the one uh, are the losses uh, and the suffering of the other. So we have uh, to re-establish re some uh, balance here. These are proposals by the Commission. And then the third one is really to support SMEs all over Europe because they are the job uh, the, the job creators and uh, a lot of households uh, with their income depend on the survival uh, of SMEs. So I've, I would not separate companies, uh, especially uh, talking about SMEs and households. They are very much in the same boat and that's, that's why it is important uh, to uh, have a strong support to particularly to SMEs, not only to SMEs, but particularly to SMEs. What, what did you think about um, the, the, the part of the speech which talked about the f emphasis on long-term skills? Because, of course, some European officials have talked about a crisis in skills in the EU. Do you share that view, that, the, that there's a real crisis in people not having the skills for the future? Well, we are in this very paradoxical uh, situation that uh, uh, we still have, uh, uh, even if the unemployment has gone down, we still have unemployed people. And on the other hand, we have uh, a real uh, 
uh, labor shortages in many sectors, especially uh, uh, IT is one example, but not only IT, there's a lot of services, but also industry. Industry is looking for, uh, for, for uh, workforce, for, for people, for qualified people. High qualified, highly qualified, but also less qualified. And here I think uh, uh, we have really to work on the mismatches on the labor market. Uh, bring in back or bring in people on the labor market. Women, for instance, yeah. we still have in many countries a low participation of women. But also young people. We have nine million, nearly nine million young people out of the labor market. Mm because they are not well skilled, because they do not have the soft skills they need. So we want really to work with this uh, population uh, to strengthen the labor force. You know, the demography in Europe is not so favorable. Yeah. But this it, is one issue. Is this a problem of people not wanting to convert their skills, those who are unemployed, for example, being somehow uh, perhaps afraid or apprehensive about learning something completely new, changing careers, or simply that they don't know what uh, aid there is out there that could actually help them to do this? Probably it's, uh, it's both. Combination. Yeah, it's a combination of both. But uh, I think we have really to motivate people, uh, young people, or people who have lost their jobs, or just people who know that uh, their jobs might be uh, lost or might change. And this is a question also of mindset, working with people to explain, social partners involve them in that, and uh, offer them also the right way to be reskilled. Uh, if I am a 50 years old worker, uh, I cannot be told to go back to school. But uh, I have to be convinced how important it is to be reskilled, to learn something new, and also to adapt the methods, how I learn uh, to uh, my, uh, uh, my experiences uh, and, uh, and to the way how uh, I want to be reskilled. Yeah. Uh, what about protecting existing jobs? So there is now an EU wide agreement on a framework for minimum wage provisions. Obviously, it is a matter for national uh, governments. But um, as I understand it, you can only encourage uh, social partners to, uh, you know, improve collective bargaining w with employers or employers rather to, to improve dialogue uh, with social partners. But there's n there isn't really an instrument that can enforce anything from, from your well, point of view. Well, first I would say uh, adequate wages and especially adequate minimum wages mm. are as necessary as ever because we are in a period where people the wages have not followed the uh, the, the the price evolution the, the inflation rate so we need uh, to uh, to keep not to decouple wages and especially minimum wages uh, with this evolution that's uh, how we should implement rapidly this directive also on adequate minimum wages Collective bargaining is part also of that, this directive. Certainly the Commission, it's not up to the Commission to impose a model. We have indeed to work with member states, social partners, that collective bargaining is uh, extended. Some countries have very good results, very good performance, other, others less. So this is also something of, about European convergence, uh, not having social or wage dumping, having convergence in terms of uh, wages and working conditions. But ultimately it's up to the, uh, the, the players in the individual countries to assess whether the minimum wage there is uh, a decent wage given the economic conditions of that country. So it's sort of saying, well, you do your own thing. Yeah, certainly we cannot have one European minimum wage. Yeah. The conditions are very different, uh, the economic and social conditions. But what is important, we have given in this directive a certain number of indicators and also procedures and also encourage social partners to work together to establish an adequate minimum wage which allows a decent life and which makes work pay. Because that's one of the reasons why people sometimes do not go uh, to the labor market because they have the impression that work doesn't pay anymore. Yeah. I want to ask you about some recent events uh, in France, uh, a, stri uh, a, a protest by riders that are employed by Uber Eats. Uh, employed obviously is a relative term in this situation, but what, what do you think of that situation? Well, this confirms the need to have uh, clear rules in this sector. 
that's what we have uh, done by proposing a directive on working conditions for platform workers and recognizing their real status and not this illusion that they are entrepreneurs and I think uh, the response we get it now we have already got it uh, in other places and we have it here with these riders many young people and uh, who are treated socially uh, in a way which uh, should not be uh, the case anymore in Europe. So essentially they should be offering uh, contracts to, to these people well, in all you cases? Know, young people also need some security in their life. Yeah. Uh, certainly we, we need some flexibility, this is a sector which needs some flexibility, but on the other hand, these young people deserve also some security in terms of protection, social protection and in terms of uh, uh, decent wages. Okay, we'll have to end it there. Thank you so much for Thank such you. a wide-ranging discussion, EU Commissioner Nicola Schmidt. Uh, do stay tuned because we'll be back very shortly with part two of this edition of Talking Europe.